Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for attending our Textile Talk. I am Emma Parker, and I am the Oral History Project Manager at the Quilt Alliance. And I'm connecting today, uh, not from my usual spot, which is Durham, North Carolina, but from a hotel room in Atlanta, Georgia. The Quilt Alliance has a booth at this year's Quilt Con Quilt Show, and it's setup day. So um, I'm doing double duty here. And if you're traveling to QuiltCon, uh, I hope that you'll come say hi to us in our labeling lounge booth. Uh, we're on the second floor. Thank you all for taking the time to join us and a special welcome, especially to those of you who are here for the first time. We're really glad you found us and I hope you'll say hi in the chat box and let us know where you're connecting from today. Uh, a quick note before we get started that this presentation does have some pre-recorded content. So if you have a pair of headphones handy, you might want to go ahead and grab them now. Um, I'm going to play the content at full volume, and you can just adjust the volume on your device for greater control. Textile Talks is a weekly series oops, uh, presented on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. by the Quilt Alliance and our partner organizations, the Studio Art Quilt Associates, the International Quilt Museum, and the Surface Design Association. All Textile Talks are recorded and available via YouTube. Thanks to our sponsors, credited just now, and donors like you, all Textile Talks are free. We will put in the link in the chat shortly for our donation page. And if you're able to make a contribution, we thank you in advance for helping keep Textile Talks free for everyone. The Quilt Alliance is the smallest member of our consortium, but our mission is huge. We are documenting, preserving, and sharing the stories of all quilts and all quilt makers. Today, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about our vision, No More Anonymous Quilt Makers, and see one of our projects in action. As a quick reminder, you can use the chat box for greetings, comments, or technical help, uh, but be sure to use the drop down menu in the chat box to select everyone if you want to share your message with everyone. Otherwise, it'll only come to panelists and I may not see it. Um, so if you want to say hi to everyone, certainly select that option. You can also use the Q&A box to ask any questions you have. Um, I will be I'm here live, but our content is pre-recorded and our panelist um, was not able to join us live for a Q&A today because she's also traveling to Atlanta. You can also turn on live captions by clicking on the live transcript slash CC button on your Zoom controls. And don't forget to grab those headphones now if you have a pair or be prepared to adjust your device volume. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Quilt Alliance and our work, we are a nonprofit dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing quilt stories. One of the main ways we do this is a project called QSOS, or Quilter Save Our Stories. It's an oral history project that's in its third decade, and it's collected, we've collected more than 1,200 long-form oral history interviews with quilters about their life and their work. All of those interviews are archived at the Library of Congress's American Folklife Center. Um, they've said that it's a very important collection to them and they really understand 
that quilt making and quilt history is important folk life to collect. The project started in the 1990s and many of the interviews were recorded on cassette tapes. Um, who remembers cassette tapes? Each of the interviews was transcribed and they were mostly experienced just as text on a page. Thanks to a very recent partnership with the University of Kentucky's Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History, our interviews with quilt makers have been digitized and we can hear these quilters' voices for the first time. We're adding more interviews to our website all the time and you can listen to people talking, um, some names you may know, and also some quilt makers you've maybe never heard of. Uh, they're a great thing to listen to while you sew. And they're not just about quilt making process, but they're also about people's lives. They're very often funny, and they're also very often quite emotional. We joke that, well, it's not really a joke, that an, uh, every QSOS interview needs some Kleenex on hand, just in case. Um, I think if you listen to the collection, you'll hear from a lot of people that will remind you of yourself and your practices or your circumstances, but you'll also hear a lot from people who are very different. And the thing that connects every one of these interviews is a shared love of quilts. We're very excited to begin moving the interviews from text only to just audio, um, but I did want to mention that we are seeking both volunteers and contractors to help us migrate these interviews to a new platform. So if you have any experience with databases or oral history and you want a volunteer project you can work on from home, you're used to copying and pasting, writing uh, short summaries, navigating between internet tabs and synthesizing information, if that sounds like you, uh, please do get in touch at qsos at quiltalliance.org and I'll share that email address again later. I also wanted to mention that one way we use the QSOS collection is our podcast, Running Stitch which is hosted by historian and writer Yannick and Smucker. And it interviews fascinating people from around the quilt world and draws from our archive of QSOS interviews. In each episode, Yannick has a conversation with a contemporary quilter or a quilt scholar, and she plays excerpts from the 1200 interviews that we have for podcast guests to respond to. So in this amazing conversation between people who maybe started quilting in the 1970s or 1980s and people who are quilting now um, and what's changed and what hasn't. So if you enjoy conversations about why we quilt, which includes uh, a little bit of historical perspective and a lively conversation, I urge you to check out Running Stitch wherever you get your podcast. Um, we've got a new season coming this spring too that we're very excited about. Our QSOS interview today is with Carol Lyle Shaw. Carol is a quilt maker who works in a wide range of styles, as you'll see in her interview. She's also a teacher who offers live lectures, workshops, and recorded on-demand classes. Um, Carol joined us for a Quilt Alliance Story Share event early on in the pandemic era, and we were so impressed with her virtual setup. We made her give us a tour of all of her camera equipment and the way that she had set up her studio. Uh, she has been a quilting instructor who continues to offer thoughtfully designed and well-executed virtual programming, which she'll talk about just a little bit. But I also wanted to say that we're featuring Carol today in part because she's one of nine participants in a very exciting initiative that we're planning to celebrate the Quilt Alliance's 30th anniversary, which is this year. So stay with me to learn a little bit more about the interview. Um, learn a little bit more about that after the interview. Um, um, spoiler alert, it starts with block and ends with of the month. Um, this interview is, as I mentioned, pre-recorded and Carol is traveling right now, so she's not available for a live Q&A. But at the end, I will share her uh, website and she says, please do get in touch with her if you have any questions. Um, if you have any questions about the Quilt Alliance's oral history projects, you can leave them in the Q&A or the chat and I'll be happy to address those uh, after we watch the interview. Hi, I'm Emma Parker, and I'm here interviewing Carol Lyle Shaw for a QSOS Quilter Save Our Stories interview. Um, today is February 2nd, 2023, and it's 11.13 a.m. Um, I'm so excited to be here virtually with Carol, and I'm going to just ask you to go ahead and start by telling us about the quilt that you have behind you. Uh, thank you, Emma, and hello, everybody who's watching this uh, from home or your car or wherever you are. <laughs> I'm really honored to be part of the uh, Textile Talk series. Uh, I watch them myself and, and just love all the things we can learn about the quilt world. The quilt behind me 
is a very recent finish. It's just the top. It has not been quilted yet. I will be sending it to a long armor because it's bigger than I like to wrestle with. It is one of my Afro-modern quilts. I love using African fabrics in a modern way. Uh, and the particular technique in, in this quilt uh, is called Parisian Curves. It's a freehand cut improv curve block. And I use different kinds of pieced strips as inserts. Uh, in the blocks themselves and then assemble it into the top. On the left and right sides, <laughs> you'll see the uh, borders. And I love piecing uh, improv segments into my borders. I have it up on the wall because I'm thinking I might add one more border to the sides in just black fabric, but I needed to sleep on it and take some photos to make that final decision. Uh, the prints that you see uh, in, the, um, in the blocks, uh, those prints are what I would call uh, the typical ty types of African fabrics that most quilters find available in uh, local quilt shops and uh, specialty stores that offer uh, these African prints. They no longer have wax in them that's the way they used to come years ago, but they don't now. Uh, although you may have some in your stash that are older that have wax, and that's a whole other segment to talk about removing wax. But these fabrics are made for uh, garment makers and quilters. They are 100% cotton. Uh, I only use 100% cotton in my modern quilts. And uh, I piece them and use them just as I would any other type of quilting fabric. Uh, I do color test, uh, and I have a blog post on my blog about testing for color fastness, just in case, but I find that today these fabrics are very, very stable, just like most of our quilting cottons. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, good so thing. when I say Afro-modern, what I'm really saying is that in, my, in these quilts, in this series of Afro-modern quilts, I use the African prints very sparingly, uh, not quite minimalist, but very sparingly, because I want to showcase one or two, maybe three prints. Uh, in this particular case, I'm using two prints that have the multiple colors in them and some black and white strips of African prints. So I want to showcase them. I, I don't want the entire surface covered with African print. I want the contrast usually with um, solids or very near solids like grunge or a modeled print or something like that. So you mentioned that this quilt is waiting maybe for a second set of borders. Um, is that, is that typical of the way that you work? You kind of work in stages and then take a picture and come back to it? Uh, yes, very much. I take lots of in-process pictures along the way as I'm making the blocks and then deciding on a final layout uh, for all of my projects because most of my work these days is improv in the modern quilts. And of course I do the same when I'm making an art quilt. Uh, and uh, I find that taking the photographs and thank heavens for our smartphones, uh, but I find that when I take the photograph and look at it later, you know, an hour later, a day later, whatever, uh, I can see things that I can't see standing, you know, two feet away from it on my design wall. Yeah. In the old, old days, we used to buy the um, little peephole things you put in your doorway. <laughs> And mm -hmm. we would look through those. We would reverse them and look oh, through wow. those to get a small image. Mm -hmm. I'm talking real old school, but you can still do that. Uh, but now almost everybody, I think, does have a phone that can take photos. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Uh, and looking at the photos really helps. I also have another secret weapon. Oh, and sometimes please tell us. Kind of thinking about a piece of work not quite sure, I will send a photo to one of my buddies, one in particular, 
and uh, she has a really lovely, wonderful eye, and she can make a couple of comments or ask a question of me about what I'm attempting to do, what my intention is, and just, you know, really help me crystallize my ideas uh, in a really brilliant way. And I, I, I love using her for that and occasionally buy her lunch. <laughs> Oh, and and she does the same. And a, and, a, and a sounding board. Yeah. Yep. And it's a mutual exchange. We uh, we trade uh, photos back and forth because she's also an art quilter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wonderful support system to have. And I urge everyone to find one or two quilt buddies who will do more than say, oh, that's so pretty, but really help you think critically about the piece. I think that's great. It's great advice and something we should all strive to have for sure. Yes. Um, do you typically work just on one quilt at a time or do you have a lot of a lot of things going on at once? I typically have a lot of things going on. I'm fortunate that I've got a really big design wall, the one behind me, and another space over to my right if I need to just hang something temporarily uh, as I think about it. Um, I work in series. And uh, this is part of the Parisian Curve series, and it is part of the Afro Modern series. So there's a parallel there. Uh, and sometimes I'll work on a piece and reach a point where I'm not quite sure where I want to go with it. And I'll pack it up in a project box mm -hmm. with the fabrics and just leave it to the side in my uh, studio space and pull out another project. Occasionally, I will start a piece as a working sample in a class I'm teaching. And uh, then if I decide that I love it enough to finish it, <laughs> I'll pick it back up at some point later. But sometimes a piece will be sitting in that bin for months. I've got a couple of pieces that I've now decided that I decided this week that I'm going to finish in the next week before QuiltCon, <laughs> before I leave for QuiltCon. Wow. Hopefully. Um, but I want to finish them now. I'm more, I'm interested again in that work. Uh, if something lingers in my bins for too long, it's a signal to me that I'm just not interested in it. And I will either put any blocks in my, you know, scrap stash and use them in a scrappy improv quilt, maybe later on, just cutting those pieces up. Uh, and then I'll put the rest of the fabric back in my stash. I don't like to have, you know, 20 in uncompleted projects hanging around. I have a few too many right now. So a couple are gonna get finished. Uh, this was one of them that got finished. And uh, a couple others I'm gonna make some hard decisions about because mm. I don't want all the clutter. Makes sense. So I do want to, I know that you work in series and you actually, you teach a class or are starting to teach a class about working in series. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that process, about how you conceive of a series and what usually is the kickoff point for you and um, whether it comes from a constraint or an idea you just can't stop thinking about. And you also mentioned, you said, I do this for my, my modern quilts and I do this for my art quilts and whether you think of those things um, as, as separate ways of working or, um, yeah, just a little bit about, the, sure. about all the different things you do and, and what it means to you to work in a series. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the working in a series because that applies to my work with, uh, in the more modern aesthetic and my work when I'm really focusing on a fine art piece, a wall, an, a wall hanging art quilt. Uh, and uh, a series for me means that I start somewhere. It could be an inspiration uh, in the work of an artist. I follow a lot of 20th and 21st century painters. I, on my own, I study their work, follow contemporary people on Instagram. And that's where a lot of my design inspiration comes from, studying the work of artists who tend to work in series. Now, for me, working in a series doesn't mean, oh, I'll make this quilt again in seven different colorways. That's something different. It's a wonderful thing to do, with, particularly if you're a pattern designer. You kind of got to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but that's not what a series is for me. A series means, uh, for example, this quilt is part of a, a long running series where I work with improv cut curved blocks. Mm -hmm. And in that series, uh, I started with a small scale with multiple layers of curves in the blocks. Then I said, well, what happens if I were to simplify that block, staying in that same scale, but fewer layers? What, and then what would happen if I created a set of those blocks, but incorporated a lot more negative space in the blocks themselves? It's a series of what if questions that change the design the design element. Uh, and along the way, as I'm answering those, or not even answering, but exploring those what if questions, I also say, well, you know, to myself, self, <laughs> you've been working in a lot of really brights so far with, you know, this particular series. What if you went with a quieter palette or a more minimalist, you know, limited number of, of colors? Uh, or explore a color palette that is really not typical for you. Uh, so I might do a couple things in the next piece in that series. And not every what if response is totally successful. Some I make a few blocks and I go, ah, this is interesting. And what I learned was X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Not interested enough to continue it though. Yeah, that's interesting. So a series means you're expanding, reinterpreting, flipping the ideas on their heads, going down, you know, different paths. And you can always see the linkages back to the core or seminal ideas or inspiration. Uh, and I, <laughs> I was looking at a very old, I mean, really old sketchbook of mine. Uh, it's, it's more of a journal sketchbook. And I was looking at photographs that I took of some pieces I made in the mid 1990s. Wow. And I realized that some of the work I'm doing in my geometric abstraction quilts link right back to those pieces. And I hadn't wow. looked at that particular page in that journal for years, literally. Wow. Uh, so it's good sometimes to look back because ideas can you know percolate hibernate uh grow in the back of your mind and uh you know you try something you put it aside in that case it was for 20 years almost and uh, then you come back to it and it's like oh my goodness this is linking right back mm -hmm. which is a fun thing to find as a surprise but sometimes i'm very deliberate to go back and look at older work and think, hmm, I think I want to explore this some more, taking it in a new direction. Yeah. Well, it sounds Art like- quilts. Um, yeah. Uh, I differentiate what we can typically call the modern quilts from the art quilts in that the modern quilts are, are typically uh, made with, you know, standard quilting cottons and, and we have so many choices now. Uh, uh, some people use linen and, and so forth, and I don't tend to use those fabrics. I tend to stick with 100% cottons. And they are grounded in the idea that they are usually functional quilts. That is, however much you explore improv or your own voice and your own vision, ultimately you're making it in such a way that it can be used on somebody's bed. It can be thrown in a washing machine etc. The art quilts, when I'm in that world, and you know, there's a crossover, and there'll always be sure. that debate. Mm -hmm. Where is the line? I don't think there is a line. I think, you know, they merge in the middle somewhere. And then you can go off to other either end of the continuum. Sure. When I'm in my art quilt world, I uh, am making work that will be unique. Each piece will have strong, unique elements in the design. They are made to be hung on the wall, like fine art. So it's like a painting, except it's made with fabric. Uh, I also explore the use of uh, what quilters would call non-traditional fabrics. It could be lace, it could be uh, repurposing 
uh, elements from clothing, you know, not necessarily my clothing, but thrift shop finds, uh, or using uh, old handkerchiefs and uh, printing on fabric with whether it's photographs or uh, doing some sort of um, surface design work. I mean, I explore a lot of different techniques that I would never use in a quilt, like the one behind me that'll be, you know, I don't know where it'll end up, maybe as a gift to somebody, or I'll just keep it because I love it mm -hmm. so much. Uh, but I can throw this, you know, on the sofa and, you know, be watching Netflix and having my favorite snack <laughs> and not worry about it because I can put it in the washing machine. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I noticed that you use the word modern, which is a word that some people have a lot of opinions about um, and are hesitant to describe their work as that because maybe they feel like modern quilts uh, are a certain way. Um, I'm curious if, <laughs> or aren't a certain way. Um, yeah. Do you, I, I'm, I'm curious what your, how you feel about using that word to describe your work and maybe you modern. don't feel any way at all about it, but. Using the word modern? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I love the fact that uh, I do still run across people who come to my class or a lecture and uh, have this perception that modern has a very rigid set of requirements or rules. Even today, there are still people out there who think, well, I, I don't, who say, I don't like modern quilts because I don't want all that gray fabric. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you haven't looked at a modern quilt in 10 years. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen a gray quilt in a while. I mean, they're out there still, people love gray. Sure. In fact, I just made a, a block for a guild, a group I'm in rather, not, not a guild, but a group I'm in where we explored grays. But modern quilts are many, many different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my lectures and of course my workshops, I really try to expose people to all, not even all, but some of the you know, pockets that exist out there. There are no modern quilt police uh, it's um, an emerging genre, emerging genre. It is fluid. We, everybody who wants to make a quilt today in and use some of the design elements that we're all playing with is free to create a new set of design elements. Like I'm working with Afro modern. That's still modern to me. Uh, and it's different from uh, what, a lot of other people are doing. I'm seeing more and more people uh, explore this aesthetic, which thrills me. Uh, and somebody else is developing somebody something else. And I will run across it in an article or on Instagram and go, oh, that's cool. Uh, it, it is a very big, big, big world this modern quilt. And if you don't want to use the word modern and use contemporary or you don't use anything at all, who cares? The point <laughs> is, let's all explore. And we build on, of course, the traditions in both traditional quilting and art quilting. We borrow some things from there too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's fine. That's, it's, it's about learning, experimenting, growth. So I use the word modern because it helps to have some language <laughs> to sure. describe it. Uh, it's a starting point. So long answer to a short question. No, that's a great, that's a great answer. Um, and I think it touches on a lot of things about, you know, feeling free to reinvent and, and it being a big tent for sure. Um, so maybe we'll go back a little bit. And I'm just curious if you'll talk a little bit about how you started quilting. Did you grow up with quilters in your family um, or are you the first the first quilter in a little while. Um, just how, how did you come to quilting and why have you stayed quilting? Um, I came to quilting many years ago because I wanted to make quilts uh, for nieces and nephews. And then my husband asked for one. I didn't know anything about quilting. I barely knew what a sewing machine was wow. uh, at the time. And, uh, what, and I wasn't aware of any quilting tradition in my family. I later discovered after I'd been quilting a few years that I had a great aunt. She was a master seamstress and I knew that about her. 
but one day visiting her, uh, she showed me a Baltimore album quilt that she had made, you know, hand handmade, you know, all hand sewn. And uh, of course it was a masterpiece. Unfortunately, it did not come to me in the family. I hope someone somewhere, one of my distant cousins has it. We, one would hope. I hope. However, it was kind of interesting to find that was there in my family and I was not aware. So anyway, I, I was self-taught for a long time, discovered art quilts when I ran across a couple of books in the library as I was just borrowing everything I could find about quilting, fell in love with art quilting. You know, the magazines that were out there at the time, this is like in the 90s. Uh, and uh, then I joined the African-American Quilters of Baltimore. And in that group, there are quilters with master heirloom level skills. And uh, they loved what I was exploring, which was wonderful. They were very welcoming. And they said, however, you need some basic skills. <laughs> and they proceeded to teach me uh, with kindness, but with discipline. <laughs> and I will it's be good forever to do grateful it. to them. So that's how I started. Yeah. Uh, and prior to picking up quilting, I had explored some other art, uh, media, painting, stained glass making, uh, and some other things, and uh, never quite found anything I really wanted to do until I discovered quilting. Because for me, I could see uh, how my interest and love of 20th and 21st century painting just informed what I was doing as I worked with fabric. It was, it was just coming, coming home, but using a different medium. Yeah, that makes, I think that a lot of people probably have a similar yes. journey that, you know, mm -hmm. they kind of were in search of their art form and were finding ways to pull in all these yeah. things they're looking at. Um, and I think for me, it was actually fortunate that I wasn't deeply embedded in the traditional quilt world. I mean, you know, I made the standard quilts we all make when we start out learning, you know, just how to make a quilt. Sure. Uh, but I wasn't uh, so embedded in that world that I had this idea that there were rules you couldn't break. And when somebody would tell me a rule, I would say, oh, that's an interesting idea, perspective. I'm <laughs> I don't care <laughs> in a nice way. I'd be nice. Uh, yeah. about it. <laughs> but, uh, I, and I think that's fortunate because I felt very free to do whatever I wanted to do, whatever, wherever my curiosity took me. And I find that uh, for some of my students and, you know, people listen to my lectures, they recognize that they carry the weight of, of restrictions coming they think from the traditional quilt world and there are some rules out there if you're making uh you know a very precisely cut and pieced quilt uh with a specific pattern you you've got to do it that way or the design will not be successful you have to choose your fabrics a certain way and that's wonderful i mean i love looking at those kinds of quilts uh, and I learned from them. I'm always learning something, no matter what I'm looking at. But I didn't come, I didn't feel constrained. And I hope that quilters today don't feel constrained. You, you can appreciate and love a lot of different genres, but not want to make them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, I think that's, it's evident in your work that you're always sort of asking questions and answering them. and. Um, in new and different ways. So I really, I admire that. Um, Thank you. And so I, you mentioned this a little bit, you said, mentioned your students, you do quite a bit of teaching now yeah. um, in a lot of different sort of modalities. You have pre-recorded classes, you've written two books, um, and you also do live lecturing. Uh, what does your quilt making week look like now? I mean, what, what do you tend to spend your time on? And yeah. Also, uh, you know, what, what do you like about teaching, especially? That's, those are great questions. Uh, I've been, last, last, the last two years, 2021, 
22, I guess it's three years now. It's uh, amazing. My, my quilt week, my, my, my work life, my life shifted mm -hmm. like everybody's did. Uh, I, uh, prior to pandemic, I had been on the road a bit uh, teaching and lecturing uh, to guilds mainly, but also at some quilt conferences and really enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, and uh, with the shift to all of us seeing how we could stay connected online virtually, uh, I really embraced that. I love teaching virtually, frankly, and uh, will do most of my teaching, almost all of it virtually going forward uh, with, you know, one or two exceptions a year for some in-person stuff. Uh, but what I love about teaching is when I can help quilters, students, find some freedom and explore what they want to explore, whether it's a certain color palette, uh, explore a certain technique in a color palette. I don't teach classes where you have to rigidly follow Carol's process and instructions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I show you my process uh, processes and techniques and what I've found worked for me. And I'm always saying this works for me. And live real time, I love it when a student, you know, they'll go away and start doing some work as a group and or individually, but then we come back together and somebody says, well, I didn't follow blah, 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 what you said. And I said, good, what did you do instead? I want to know. <laughs> and, I'm, you know, people will reinvent or find a better way, a different way for them. And, uh, you know, sometimes I've picked up tips that I use in my own work because I thought, oh, I never thought of trying that. I hmm, think I will see what happens. Uh, so I just love the exchange of ideas and helping people break free of what might feel like constraints. Even when I teach a class that technically is grounded in a pattern, <laughs> there's always an improvisational aspect or some freedom you can take even in making that pattern. And I really encourage that in, in the class. So that's what I love. I love being able to connect. Being virtual means I can, I can connect with students all over the world. I just taught uh, a workshop for a group of quilters who were all, with one exception, I think, based in the UK. And, uh, you know, we set up a time frame that worked for them and uh, didn't, I wasn't teaching it middle of the night. I've done that in the past with a group in Australia. I mean, you know, I'm not going to travel to England to teach, you know, a two day workshop or something mm -hmm. that's no longer, especially now, no longer financially. Uh, feasible for most groups right but you know I can connect with people and learn with people from all over the world and I love that I absolutely cool. love it mm -hmm. <laughs> one one of one thing you teach is a, a class or a workshop on sustainable stashing yeah and um you did a version of it for our quilt alliance fundraiser we'll just take a moment mm -hmm. and I sat in on it just as the you know the tech backup moderator and it really sure. has changed the way I think about my stash Wonderful. Um, yeah I really I really enjoyed it and you know I think it's it goes beyond sustainability and also you kind of start thinking about what you can and can't do and what kind of the way that you want to make the things that you want to make yes um and I'm just curious how that idea of sustainability considered really broadly has shaped your work um and how you came to that topic yeah, it, it, I have been, I started just sort of ruminating about sustainability because I do try to recycle and learn about, uh, you know, the world and how, you know, well, I won't go into all that, but the world and the sure. impact we have as consumers uh, on the world and on the rest and on other people in the world. My consumption habits have an impact on the lives of other people. Uh, so I came to, well, and, and a couple of things happened. When we moved here to Florida over 10 years ago now, we downsized our living space and that was intentional. 
So that meant to prepare for that move, I had to confront the fact that I had become a fabric hoarder. And I use that term quite deliberately. It feels harsh and it was true. I say it about myself. And I caution people to not call themselves curators if you're actually hoarding. <laughs> I was buying fabric, you know, everywhere. And I had a million yards of it. Uh, and so when we were ready to move, I thought, well, my space is gonna be smaller. I am not gonna pay to store fabric down in Florida. So that meant I had to de-stash. And I did a bunch of that in many different ways. And that kind of started me thinking about my buying habits because my sustainability uh, focus is on our buying and using. Uh, other people work beautifully in the space of uh, thrifting, buying from thrift stores, repurposing clothing. Uh, and I love you know, learning with and from them, but that's not my focus. My focus is on what we have in our homes. Now, the other thing that happened uh, that was, had a huge impact was that my guild was contacted by a couple of families of quilters who had passed along. They were not members, but the families found us and offered us their stash. And looking at the amount of fabric that those quilters had accumulated that they would never, had they lived to be 120, they might've used it all if they'd never bought another new piece. That was shocking to many of us in the guild. And a lot of us said, oh, I need to think about my own life and my family and, you know, heaven forbid, you know, something should happen. What am I leaving them to, to do? You know, what's, what's, the, what's the clutter in my quilt life here? And so there were many events that uh, got me thinking about this. And then I decided to be more proactive in the quilt world and talk about it in a direct way. And, you know, and that, so that's how the lecture uh, and actually a short workshop uh, that I uh, have offered. I think it's important that we keep it in conversation. This is not, I am not talking about never buying another piece of fabric. Mm -hmm. I buy fabric. And, you know, as I say in the lecture, there are some strategies I use uh, today that I never used in the past. So it has definitely impacted uh, my buying. It has impacted also even my making mm -hmm. because I am much more focused on what do I have that will work in this project as opposed to do I need to buy some new fabric. No, I just made a, uh, a block using grays and I discovered in my gray <laughs> solid stash, they were all almost the same value. <laughs> <laughs> that does make it tricky. Yes. And so I had a real design challenge, but I powered through it and I was, I'm pleased with my result. And, uh, Maybe at QuiltCon or some other point, I will have to do some different stashing in my gray stash, but it's not an immediate need. You know, at some point I will have to, you know, expand the values <laughs> that I have mm -hmm. in my fabrics. I like that as the mindset is saying, you know, oh, well, you know, my stash is all of a similar value. This is a design problem, not this is a, a reason to go shopping. Um, Perfectly think, said. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Think, I have think, been thinking about that and the difference between buying something because you really like it and buying something because it's something you're likely to use. Um, it's something that I, I try to keep in mind because the fabrics I love are very rarely the fabrics I use and want to use and end up using in the kind of quilts I make. So yes, <laughs> it's something to keep in mind for sure. Yes, um, it is. So, we have, we have time for just a few more questions and I'm gonna ask two of my favorite questions from uh, the QSOS list. The first you, you mentioned a little bit is um, there's, there's two questions that are adjacent on the list. And one is what quilters have influenced you and the other is which artists have influenced you. I would argue that maybe those questions are, can be the same, um, but um, who, who do you look for for inspiration? It can be fine art, it can be you know, graphic design, other quilters. Um. Sure. 
Uh, when I'm, and this is usually on Instagram, to be honest, when I'm on social media and I'm looking at work of quilters that I follow, uh, they are typically people who are in my uh, space of improvisation. And I look at their work because I just, you know, admire what they're doing. Uh, I actually try not to, to be influenced because I don't want to be so influenced that my work starts to look like their work. That's right. That would not be a happy place for me. Uh, so uh, I guess I would say that what I'm looking at in those quilters uh, is their bravery, <laughs> their willingness to step away from something that everybody just goes, oh, I love what you're doing. Step away from that and do something different. Mm -hmm. And I love watching that process. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's just thrilling to me to see it, to see that. Yeah. And, and not all of them are modern quilters. There are a couple people whose work I look at who I would say are more modern traditional or even traditional, whatever. Uh, I definitely follow people who use textiles, qu the quilt making process to tell stories, to tell their life stories. Uh, that is of interest to me because that's a theme I follow in my art quilt work uh, very strongly. So I'm, you know, occasionally, you know, saying, oh, well, let's see what some people are up to in, in that part of the world, which is more the art quilt world. Yeah. Uh, in terms of artists, the genre of artists that I follow these days are uh, usually using the hashtag geometric abstraction or hard edge, ex abs <laughs> I can't say it, hard, <laughs> hard edge abstraction. That's the other hashtag. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll just jump on, I'll, I'll hit that hashtag uh, and just scroll through and see what folks are doing. They're typically working with acrylics. I also look at collage because I love, I love collage. And occasionally I'll make some collages with paper or paper and fabric, uh, painting on paper, you know, repurposing or something. Uh, so that's a, a world that I, I do look at as well. I've also looked at uh, black and white photographers. There's a hashtag for that, black and white photography. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look at those, that world of work because I'm always looking at how they're using light and shadow, which is about values, light, medium, and dark values. Uh, and I love to do photography. I did it quite heavily many, many years ago. Uh, I even had my own dark room for a while in my kitchen, basically. Because <laughs> uh, I could make it dark enough. Yeah. Uh, and then in another space in another house that could be made dark enough. But I look at that hashtag, again, from the perspective of looking at how they work with the design elements, foreground and background and how they position focal points in the photography. It's, I just love looking at the work. And uh, occasionally I work in black and white, but not very often, but I'm always looking at value difference. Hmm. So interesting. I love the idea of using a hashtag on Instagram like that to, as an entry point, especially to a, a world where you may not know who specifically Mm -hmm. is doing that kind of work. That's a really great yes. idea. Um, it's a good tip. So um, so the second question on the QSOS list that I always like to ask is, um, in what ways or do you think that your quilts reflect your culture or identity? Sure. Uh, the most obvious uh, reflection, of course, is uh, that as an African-American woman, I am aware a little bit of my uh, genetic heritage uh, in Africa. Uh, so the work of African 
artists, particularly contemporary artists, uh, is of great interest to me. The uh, African fabrics that I've used over the years, uh, the 100% cottons, as well as some of the other uh, fabrics that are made by artisans in Africa, such as Bogolan or what we call mud cloth, for example, uh, indigo fabric and uh, kente cloth. I've collected and used some of those fabrics more in my art quilt work. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I am making conscious links to that part of, of my heritage. Uh, and, and have done so for, you know, since I've started making quilts, really. Uh, and it's uh, very affirming to bring that into today. Uh, the other uh, world or other way that I uh, that dig into my own heritage is in the series of art quilts that I've made where I am reflecting on the service of men and women, black men and women who served in the US Army primarily during World War II, uh, a little bit before that, a little bit of Korea, but I collected uh, photographs from my family and then I went on eBay and collected some photographs of, of known and unknown people in uniform, men and women, uh, sometimes knowing the background of those photographs, sometimes not but I've made a series of art quilts using that material, uh, printing the photographs on fabric and then using a variety of fabrics and approaches uh, to that work. So that's another historical link. Uh, my father and uncles served in the army and uh, the merchant marine uh, in World War II slash Korea timeframe. So there's a family link there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's, and oh, and I guess in the, um, in the fine art world, I study the work of African-American uh, 20th and 21st century painters as well, mm -hmm. uh, and textile artists, uh, people like Faith Ringgold, for example, and others, many, many others. Uh, yeah. Too many to mention, <laughs> but I, their work and their exploration of African-American culture uh, does influence some of my work as well. Well, I have a million other questions I'd like to ask. I know <laughs> you're a really good quilt documentarian and um, do a lot of work of documenting your quilts and keep quilt journals. I, we may have to have a whole separate session just about that. But um, my last question is a question I stole from Quilt Alliance Board President Francis O'Rourke Dowell, who often asks this. But my, my question is, what, what do you think is next for you? What are you starting to get into that you're excited about? Okay. <laughs> um, that you can feel on the horizon that you feel like is the next could be a quilt project or a class or something mm -hmm. that's that's starting for you. Uh, well, one thing I'm starting is I am committing to doing the 100 day project. Ooh, okay. And uh, that's hard for me to sustain <laughs> 100 days, but I'm going to think of it a day at a time, as they say. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what medium I'm going to use. I, I did a blog post where I'm I have a, an initial thought. I may change that before I start, but uh, it will be small pieces, obviously, you know, one a day for a hundred days. That's, I'm curious about where I will take that and see what yeah. I do. I think it's going to be textile and I think it's going to be handwork, oh, wow. which I don't okay. do much of. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what else is on my brain design wall. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually coming back to making more portrait quilts, the spirit portraits. Uh, I want to really dive even deeper into that world. And uh, I'm, I've got some designs for the geometric abstraction series. So, and those are two very different ways of working. So that's where I think I'm going to be focusing for the next few months. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. We'll have to 
check back and see where those projects are going and yeah. follow along if you're sharing some of your 100 day work too. That's yeah. Exciting. Yep, the 100 day projects will be posted on Instagram. Great. Yeah, so we'll, we'll share where I go. We'll share, we'll share a bunch of links for everyone in the textile talk so you can follow along. Um, so thank you again, Carol. It's really lovely. Thank well, thank you. you. And I really appreciate the invitation, Emma. And it's been a delight talking with you. I love the way you ask questions and oh, reflect. And it was just easy and fun. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Carol is such an interesting quilt maker, even though I feel like I say that after every QSOS interview. Um, I've included her website here, and if you'd like to learn any learn more about anything she mentioned in this interview or just want to get in touch, you can find contact information for Carol um, and more information about her upcoming workshops and lecture opportunities, all of that there. Finally, after listening to Carol's quilting stories, I just hope you'll think about your own. The QSOS interview project will be relaunching this year with updated interview guidance and a streamlined interview workflow. And we're also piloting a series of community quilt documentation days, starting with towns in Southern Appalachia, including Western North Carolina, East Tennessee, and Eastern Kentucky. We'd love to hear from you if you live in one of those places, but even if you're not, I hope this has piqued your interest in sharing more about your process, your inspiration, and your perspectives. Maybe you have a special quilt maker in your life who has a story you think should be documented. Consider recording a QSOS interview. It's easy, even I can do it or a short form three minute go tell it interview. That's just one person talking about one quilt for up to three minutes. They say that there's one quilter in almost every 11 American households, though I did the math once and I don't think that's quite right, but it sounds good. And I know many of you are outside of the United States, but I think it's important to remember that the quilting community is very large and very diverse. There are as many reasons to keep quilting as there are quilters, and hearing from people across the quilt making spectrum is an amazing source of inspiration, which is why I love these interviews so much. You can visit our website at quiltalliance.org um, or send me a note if you're interested in a community quilt day in your area, learning more about the QSOS project or recording a short form go tell it interview. And we're almost out of time and I didn't tell my boss I'm going to do this, but I did want to let Textile Talk listeners in on a little surprise. Um, we are going to announce this in our booth at QuiltCon, which starts tomorrow, but I'm going to spill the beans a day early, which is that this year is the 30th anniversary of the Quilt Alliance. And one of the ways that we're celebrating is our very first block of the month project. We're going to have nine amazing blocks, one of which was designed by Carol. And each of them features some aspect of their quilt story and will also have guidance and tips to think about documenting and reflecting on your own quilt story. So you can learn more on our website. We should have a page up very shortly, um, but it's available to Quilt Alliance members or anyone donating $30 or more, and it starts in April. So uh, I want to say thank you again to our sponsors for making Textile Talks 100% free, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more about them now. Thank you, everyone.